And so we'll have a table, something like this. Now, if tables worry you or, or frighten you, that's okay. You just have to get used to working with them. So with practice becomes comes experience. With experience, fear goes away. All right, so if these kinds of, if the numbers start jiggling around and looking crazy, that's okay at the beginning. Just get through the first few problems with me and then we'll take it one step at a time. So we have some sort of table that involve ponds. These are going to be ponds of water and we have different, uh, don't worry if you don't know what these things are, but these are different things that are involved in the water, uh, in the water um, chemistry. So phosphate level, nitrate level, ammonia level. There's a bunch of numbers there, right? So let's take a look at what the scenario actually is. It says Sherry recorded levels of certain chemicals from a random sample of eight of the 35 local ponds, right? The results are shown in the table below and all the readings are in parts per million. So parts per million, all right? Um, so phosphate, for instance, for pond number one came out to 0.004 parts per million. So that means if you take a, a million drops of water, then one of those drops, or, or, or I should say 0.004 of those drops uh, would be uh, compared to a million drops would be the amount. So these are all very small amounts. You can see the nitrate levels are very high, 25 parts per million. And then these phosphate levels are very, very low and the ammonia very, uh, levels are right in between the two. So it's just a relative way uh, it's not really grams or anything like that. It's just a relative way of comparing the amounts of these uh, chemicals that are dissolved. So how many ponds did we sample again? Eight ponds, uh, but there are a total of 35. Question number one, how many ponds from the sample have a phosphate reading below 0 0.004 and an ammonia reading above 0 0.03? So we're asking phosphate below 0 0.004 uh, and ammonia above 0 0.03. So phosphate below 004, that's not below. This is below, but we have to go over here and say, okay, we need below 0.004 in, the, in that column, and ammonia has to be bigger than 0.03, and this one is bigger than 0.03. So I'm gonna put a little, little dot here on the side to remind me that this is one of those two. So how many have below 0.004 and above 0.03? This is one of them. This is not below 0.004, this is not below 0.004, this one's below 0.004, is this one above 0.03? Yes, it is. So this is another one. Put a little dot right there. Uh, and this one is not below 0.004 either. So really there's only two rows in this table where the phosphate is below 0.004 and simultaneously the ammonia is above 0.03. So the question, how many ponds from the sample have a reading below in this column and above in the other column? There's only two of them. So I'll put a number two. All right. Let's take a look at problem number two. It says, Sherry's ideal level of nitrate in a pond is somewhere between 20 and 33 parts per million. What percent of the ponds in the sample are within this range? What percent of the sample uh, of the ponds are in that range there? So uh, let's see here, what percent of the ponds in the sample? Yes, yeah, so between 20 and 33 parts per million. So between 20 and 33 parts per million, and we're looking at nitrate between 20 and 33 between 20 and 33. This is between 20 and 33, so I'll put a little dot right there, right? 20 and 33, that works. 20 and 33, nope, that's too big. 20 and 33, nope, that's too big. 20 and 33, yes, that one. 20 and 33, no, that one's also too big. So actually, there's only three ponds where the range is between 20 and 33 parts per million in the nitrate out of a total of, how many ponds did we sample? Six ponds. Right, so what percentage of the sample? This works out to when you divide by three, one half, divide by three, divide by three. One half, as you know, is 0 0.5. And when you convert 0 0.5 to a decimal and multiply by 100, you get 50%. Because 0 0.5 times 100, you move the decimal two spots and it makes 50%. So the answer is 50% of the ponds have a nitrate range uh, there. So what percent? 50% of the ponds in the sample are in this range. All right, just great. find the fraction, convert to a decimal, multiply by 100. All right, let's take a look at this uh, part here, part C. Based on the information in the table, how many of the local ponds are likely uh, to be within the ideal range of nitrate? How many are likely to be within the ideal range of nitrate? How many ponds did we actually sample right here? We go up here and it says we sampled eight ponds, but actually when you go over here to our table, we only have six ponds here. So that's a little bit of a typo here. I'm sorry, it doesn't really affect the problem, but I'm still gonna go ahead and change this to a number six. We actually, in our problem statement, we, we really didn't 
uh, sample eight ponds. We only sampled six of them. Sorry about that. Now it says, uh, and we use the correct number in our calculation, three of the six, uh, because we had six ponds in our table, three of the six came out to 50% of those ponds. So everything's correct. It's just we have a little typo in the problem statement. So down here, based on the information in the table, how many of all the local ponds are likely to be within the ideal range? We just figured out that 50% of the ponds are in the sample are in the ideal range, 50% of them. And we know that there are 35 ponds total. So all we need to do is take this percentage here, but convert it to a decimal, 0 0.50, and we'll multiply by how many ponds are in the population, 35. So basically, we use the sample to figure out uh, there's 50% of the ponds in the sample that are in the ideal range of nitrate, and we'll just assume that the sample is accurately reflecting the population of 35. Pond. So we'll apply that same percentage to the total number of ponds in the population. And what do we get as an answer? Multiply by 35, we get 17.5 ponds. Now we really cannot have half of a pond. Um, I, I guess you could kind of pretend you could cut one in half, but really when we apply something like this, it's like having half of a child in a, in a statistical analysis. You can't have half of a child either. On average, it's 17.5 ponds, but this really means between 17 and 18 ponds are what we expect. So what we will say here is that between 17 and 18 ponds. So based on the information in the table, how many of the ponds are likely in the range of the ideal range? Well, first we look at the table, figure out what percentage from the table or in the ideal range turned out to be 50%. We make the assumption, because we're doing good statistical work and having a good random sample, that this sample that we do is also representative of the population on a percentage basis. So we take 50%, the same number we calculated, and we apply it to the total number of ponds, 35. We get an answer of 17.5, which just means we expect somewhere between 17 and 18 ponds to uh, be in the ideal nitrate range. Now, it could be a little farther, a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, but if our sample is good, it should be pretty close. Now, let me take this down. We have two more, and then we'll wrap up the uh, remainder of this lesson. All right, here's problem number two. We have a busy looking table, but let's focus on the columns here. We have students in a class. We actually have 10 students that we've sampled. We have their eye color, their hair color, and do they have dimples? Uh, on their face, yes or no, kind of thing. Let's take a look at the scenario. It says, Carlos wrote down the physical characteristics of a random sample of 10 students out of his class of 40 students. The results are shown in the table below. And it's not a big surprise that each student can have a certain eye color, blue, brown, green, and so on, hair color, brown, blonde, black, red, and so on, and yes, no on the dimple. So we just had to uh, make that into a table. And the results are shown. Problem number one, how many more students in the sample have brown eyes than blue eyes? Brown eyes than blue eyes. So how many more have brown than blue? So brown, we're just gonna write down brown and we're gonna write down blue, right? How many people have brown eyes? So we just go straight down. We have 10 students in the sample and notice that a random sample of 10 students. So everybody is in our table here. And how many people have brown eyes? So there's one, there's two, uh, here's three, here's four, here's five, here's six. So there's actually six students in this list that has brown eyes. How many people have blue? There's one, two, and that's it, two. So how many more people have brown than blue? Six minus two, that's four, four more students. So how many more students in the sample have brown eyes than blue? Four more, all right? Very easy little problem. It's just mostly going into a table, pulling out information, and doing a simple little calculation. Part B, what percent of the students in the sample have brown eyes and black hair? What percent in the sample have brown eyes and black hair? Brown eyes and black hair. I'm saying it so I don't forget it. Brown eyes and black hair. So we need brown eyes. So here's brown eyes, there's brown hair. That doesn't count. It's brown eyes, and let's just double check. Brown eyes and black hair. So. Brown eyes, that doesn't count. Brown eyes and black hair, that's one. I'll put a dot there. Brown eyes here, black hair, that doesn't count. Brown eyes, that doesn't count. Uh, brown eyes, brown eyes, that doesn't count. It has to be brown eyes and black hair, brown and black. So there's another one. So if I'm doing this correctly, only two of these students out of the 10 actually have brown eyes and black hair. So I just said it out loud. Two students out of a total sample size of 10. Two out of 10, all right? Now, when you simplify this fraction, divide by two, two divided by two is one, 10 divided by two is five. So that's one fifth. 
and you might remember this, or you could run it through a calculator, or you could do the long division, this works out to exactly 0 0.2. Now, as a percentage, if you take this decimal, multiply by 100, the decimal moves two spots, and it works out to 20%, right? So 20%. And so the question is, what percent of the students in the sample have brown eyes and black hair? We just count them up, divide by the total number, and that forms a decimal, convert to a fraction, to a percentage, and it works out to 20% of the students. All right, let's take a look at part C. Based on the sample, how many students in the class likely have dimples? So here we're doing extrapolation. We wanna know how many in the class. Remember that we only asked 10 students about their characteristics, but there's actually 40 people in the class. So we use the sample to calculate the percentage of the kids that have dimples, and then we apply that same percentage to the entire population, which is 40 students. So we wanna first figure out how, uh, what percentage have dimples, right? So let's go back to our data here. How many have dimples? All right, so let's go down and take a look. No, 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 here's one, and here's two. So there's only two that actually have dimples, and there's a total of 10. So two out of 10 have dimples, so again, that's one fifth. It's the same math as the line before, which is 0 0.2, which is 20% have dimples, right? So the coincidence that they're the same, the numbers are the same, but for totally different reasons. This was a different problem. So 20% have dimples. Now we make the assumption that our sample is a good representation of the population. So then we know the population is actually 40 students in class, and we multiply by the 0 0.20 applying the same percentage, so taking 20% of 40, and you know that two times four is eight, and so you know there's gonna be an eight in there somewhere. When you take this and you multiply by 40, you're gonna get exactly eight. A, a better, another way to do it in your mind is if you take 10% of something, you just move the decimal back one position. So if it was 10%, it would be four people, but since it's 20%, it's double that, it's eight people. So do the long division, do it in your head, do it in the calculator, either way, you're gonna get eight students. So the question is, based on the sample, how many students in the class likely have dimples? The answer is eight, all right? And we get that by taking a look at the sample that we have, finding the percentage of students that have dimples, then applying that percentage to the whole population. We have one more of these. Let me take this down. We'll wrap up the last problem in this lesson right now. All right, let's take a look at our last problem. We have a table of data. It involves plants, and we have five plants that we have recorded information on, the type of plant, squash, tomato, pepper plant, um, the height of the plant in centimeters, and is the plant flowering or not? So we collect this raw data of five plants. Let's take a look at the scenario here. Lily observed a random sample of five of the 300 plants she has planted this year. The results are shown in the table below. Okay, so this is a sample of five, but actually her garden has 300 plants. That's the population. All right, let's take a look at our first problem. It says, what percent of the plants in the sample are shorter than 25 centimeters and flower, flowering? So shorter than 25 centimeters and flowering. Shorter than 25 centimeters and flowering. Okay, this is shorter than 25 centimeters. This is flowering. Okay, this is one of them. This is shorter than 25 and flowering. That's another. This is not shorter than 25. Discard it. This is shorter than 25 and flowering. This is shorter than 25, but not flowering, so we do not count that, that one. So there's actually only three of them that are actually shorter than 25 centimeters and flowering. Three of these guys out of an entire sample size of only five plants, three-fifths. Now, when you put this in a calculator or do it long, long-form division, three divided by five is 0 0.6, and then as a percentage, multiply it times 100, and you get 60%. So the question, what percentage are shorter than 25% in flowering? The answer is 60%. 60%. Okay, great. Let's take a look at problem number two. It says, based on the sample, how many plants would you expect to see, or how many plants would you expect to be squashed? Now, based on the sample, it says. So we wanna take a look at, in the table, calculate the percentage of squash plants, and then apply that to the whole population, which is 300 plants. So how many are squash plants in the sample? In the sample, we have one, two, three squash plants, again, out of a total of five. So the numbers are the same, but for a totally different reason. So three-fifths, 0 0.6, which is, as you know, is 60%. We just talked about that. Now, how many squash plants would we expect to find in the entire population? Well, there's 300 in the population, 
times 0 0.60, and when you multiply those out, you get 180 plants. Should be squash. So 180. So the question is, based on the sample, how many plants would you expect to be squash? 180. And this is just based on our, our five little old samples, you know, essentially. Let's take a look at the last problem. Looking back at her records, Lily finds that she planted 100 pepper plants. 100 pepper plants. Does her sample accurately reflect the population? What could be done to improve the sample? So basically, she knows that she actually planted 100 pepper plants. But what does the sample say? The sample says, over here, let's go over here and take a look at the sample. We're talking about pepper plants now. We're talking about pepper plants. The sample says she, were, she actually only planted one pepper plant out of five. One pepper plant out of five. So one out of five. That's 0 0.2, which is 20% pepper. So from her sample, her sample says that she uh, planted 20% pepper plants. However, the actual problem says she looks back at her records and she finds that she actually planted 100 pepper plants. But don't forget, she actually planted 300 total plants. So from her actual record, she goes back and says, okay, so from the population, she actually planted 100 pepper plants out of a total of 300. When you divide by 100 on the top and the bottom, that works out to one third. But one third is 0 0.3 repeating. And if you multiply by 100, you move the decimal two spots, you get 33.3 .3 repeating percent, right? So the question is, does, let's read it exactly the way it is phrased. Uh, what, uh, let's see here, does her sample accurately represent the population? What could be done to improve her sample? Does her sample accurately reflect the population? Well, from her actual records, she really and truly did plant 33% of the plants as pepper plants. I guess I could put pepper down here. Right? But in actuality, in her sample, only one out of five in her sample meant that she only planted 20% of the sample were actual pepper plants. These are quite different. So I would say, because they're so different, 20 and 33%, I would say, to answer this question down here, does her sample accurately uh, represent the population? No, it doesn't. The, the, the percentages are too different. When I calculate the percentage of the pepper plants in the sample and I look at the actual percentage of pepper plants in the population, it's very, very different. So this sample is not that great. It doesn't accurately reflect the, the, the varieties of, it, it doesn't accurately reflect the population very well. If it did, then the numbers would be very close. So what can we do, right? Well, we see right here that she did a random sample of only five plants. Can you imagine just asking five of your friends what their favorite food is, or five random people what their favorite food is, and then drawing a conclusion about 300 people in an auditorium? I'm gonna throw a party in an auditorium. I'm gonna decide if I'm gonna serve spaghetti or steak or burgers or vegetarian or seafood. I'm going to decide all that based on five people. I'm going to ask five people and then I'm going to decide based on that what I'm going to serve to 300. That makes no sense. This sample size is too small. And so the answer of the question, what can be done to improve her sample? I'm not going to write it down, but the biggest thing you could do would be to increase the sample size. Also make sure it's random. Make sure you're when you're sampling in the garden that you're looking in all different rows and all different positions and you're not only looking in one local area. Maybe the soil is a little bit better uh, in one area, or maybe when you planted them originally, you weren't so random about the way in which you planted everything in your garden. So you have to make sure that you randomly sample the garden, but you also need to make sure you have more than five. It's just too small. So I'd like you to practice these. Make sure you understand the concept. And reading a table is a skill that you just have to kind of get used to. And I know that there's a lot of numbers, and but we just have to do a bunch of problems to get over that fear of seeing a table full of numbers. Then when you understand these problems, follow me on the part two. We're going to get more practice with data analysis and infer uh, 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 inferences uh, from data that is contained in a table. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.